Hi everyone. We're going to jump on to a semi-new topic. It's actually highly related to what we were looking at before with object or in programming. We're going to be looking at inheritance. Now that's not whether you get money from your grandmother or anything like that. This is actually how you can how you can actually not have to reuse or copy and paste code a bunch of times. One of the big advantages, the moment you have objects, the moment these people realize that they have objects, they realize that there's something else that they get for free, almost for free, and that's inheritance. That if I make an object of one type, a class of one type, if I make something slightly different, I can use the previous code and just sort of add to it without just copying and pasting. And this is where, this is one of the three main things, one of them being encapsulation, which is why we were hiding all our private variables and why we were only exposing things via getter and setter functions. The idea that your object knows about itself and you sh no one else should know anything about it, right? You know what your student number is, you know what your GPA is, nobody else should know unless they need to know. That's encapsulation. We have inheritance, which is I don't reuse stuff. If you were a Carleton student, there's something you can say about all Carleton students. You guys are a special kind of Carleton student. You actually have to go, you know, on normal years and normal times. You have to go so schlub it over to, if, that, if that's the right term. You have to uh, drag yourself over to Algonquin on a regular basis. You have a slightly different thing. You're also in the in Fed, the Faculty of Engineering, unless you're not in the Faculty of Sciences. There are particular things about you guys as Carleton students, but there's a lot that you have in common with every other Carleton student. Not all Carleton students obviously are the same. Obviously they're not the same. So you have something very particular for people in your degree program. Let's make a class of BIT students or NET students or, you know, uh, CSIT students. And they are special, it's a special subclass or a special specialized version of all Carleton students. Um, so this is what we're going to be talking about with inheritance. And then finally, the third thing. So encapsulation, inheritance. And then we're going to talk about polymorphism after that. Polymorphism is allowing us to make multiple, uh, to, uh, it has something of many forms. So two functions with the same name, you call the correct one based off of the input parameters. We've seen that already. But we're going to see other things related to inheritance. So this is not exactly the same. We call, we're going to be talking about parents and children like this, but not really literally like your children or my children. I guess many of you may not have kids. Some of you may. This is more that it's uh, the parent passes on genetic information to their children. Their children are going to be like their parents, but a little bit different. That's sort of the idea. A parent class and a child class. The parent class, the child class is everything like the parent but it has a bit more stuff, or it's a bit different, slightly different. We're going to be looking at constructors a bit more, and then we're going to look at protected and private stuff, but not that won't be today. Uh, what the heck is inheritance? Why do we have this protected and private stuff other than this, what we were talking about before with encapsulation? And why do we want to use inheritance? And the big one is, I want to reuse my code. I do not want to reinvent the wheel 40 times. It's bad enough that all my for loops look identical to one another, and I probably could do things as a programmer. I should learn other techniques to make it a bit better. Uh, but we, besides that, I do not. I've I've done this before in industry where I couldn't use inheritance, and so I ended up like I'm going to take the exact same thing as I had before, copy and paste it over, move stuff around change this, change that. I've already done this in front of you guys as well. When we took the linked list uh, structures, moved them over, made linked list objects out of it. But it would be even worse if I want a doubly linked list. I just take what I have in linked list and duplicate everything all over again and then, just make, then make some changes. One of the reasons I don't want to do this is because if I duplicate all this code, and then I find out the original code that I've duplicated, the thing that I've, you know, I've done it 40 times, and then I find out, uh, it's like me printing up, making the exam. I print up 400 copies of the exam, and then I find a typo. I have to change 400 exams now. In a similar way, if I make one, if I duplicate my code a bunch of places, and then I find out I have an error in one, one part of my code, I gotta change it in all those places. 
again, I want to be effectively or efficiently lazy. And inheritance allows me to do that. It allows me to customize something that already exists and make a little bit, put a little bit of a tweak on it. We've already looked at if you want a refresher on what object-oriented design looks like. We've uh, you can watch the previous videos, of course. Again, uh, the, normally I'd go over this all over again if for a live class, but just to quickly recap. What is an object? It's anything you want it to be. It's the fact that your data and your and your functions are wrapped together. And so this could be related to data code, some kind of data structure. It could be based on some physical thing like a game object, like a ghost and, and a video game. It could be a database. It could be based on the functionality that it provides, like a timer. It could be anything you want. It's up to you to make the right decisions on how you encapsulate or how you wrap up things in objects. Uh, once you decide on a class, you have to follow. You normally follow the follow, following steps. You figure out what the heck the functions are, what the variables are, what the kind of member variables are. So the outline, if you will, that's what your header file is for. I'd actually go one step further. Uh, I'm going to use another step. Step one, use paper, figure it out, do not code. Step two, fill out your header file. Step three, fill out your CPP file. Step four, make sure that you've included your CPP file that you're going to use, uh, that use the class, I'm going to have to include the header file. That's a minor part of this second step, if you will. Every single CPP file needs to know about the header file, the where everything is outlined. So I have an outline. I had the header, the CPP file. My header file can be included in a whole bunch of other people's files. We've seen that already as well. So I have the same header file included in a bunch of different CPP files, just to make sure everyone knows about these functions in this class. If other people need to know about this function, I include the header file. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't hurt anything. It's a first come first serve. The first first class to find it includes it everyone else sort of rips it out later to make sure and so you don't have duplication so let's go back to our really silly example that I had I talked about instead of in a in a um, uh, procedural language what I'd end up doing is I'd be in control of every single one of these cars on the road myself and I'd be like oh this car over here I'm going to move this this far this car over here I'm going to move it this far I have these functions that modify my structures the structure doesn't modify itself Right? I pass the structure into a function, it does stuff. It would be like me controlling every car on the road. Instead, what I want to do is just tell every car, you know, drive. The idea is the car knows about itself, it knows how to do certain things. If you think of it as an object, you can now you have all the cars sort of talking to each other or communicating some way with the other driver. Every driver communicates with other, every other driver on the road. You're paying attention to the other cars on the road. You worry about your own gas, you worry about your own miles, you know, the check engine light. You don't necessarily worry about other cars on the road. I'll go one step further though. These are not just cars. I don't know if they have a, there's a bus over here, there's a motorcycle right here, there's a van right here, there's a little mini truck over here. There's a bunch of different types of vehicles on the road. Vehicles would be the parent class of everything, of all of these various means of transportation. That could include an airplane, it could, recur, uh, it could include a horse and buggy, it could be a motorcycle, it could be a speedboat. It's, they're all vehicles. A car is a subclass of, of, motor vehicle, uh, of particular motor vehicles. And you can break that down further. You could have electric cars and gasoline cars and then you can break those down further into Mazdas and then to Hondas or whatever that you want to do. The idea however is that if you know all cars on the road have to have certain qualities I define those qualities and I find that define those functions one place in the parent class. I define a class of vehicles or, mo or, car or motor vehicles and with everything they can do. Then I define a, uh, a subclass of cars and everything they can do. I ignore the stuff that's already been defined. I just do the little thing that's different. And then maybe I have electric cars, and so I don't. I change things around again. Electric cars, though, don't have miles per gallon now, do they? 
I can change some of the things I may have in the parent class may not be in the child class. Some of the things in the child class might be new or might be different. Every vehicle on the road has data that it works with, but not every data, every vehicle on the road has the same data. They have some commonalities, they have some differences, there are some exceptions to rules. You're used to working with this in your daily life. All humans are alike. Canadians are different than other people on the planet for X, Y, and Z reason. Right? The fact I said Z. Not different than everybody. British people also say Z, but there are some commonalities amongst Canadians. Uh, there's some commonalities amongst Francophone Canadians, which are a subset of all Canadians. Uh, there's commonalities amongst Newfoundlanders, which are different than a subset of all Canadians, right? There all there have some common they have some differences as well within those groups. But you can theoretically break down groups of all humanity as a class, humans as a class, and then break it into sm subgroups. Um, men and women, for example, or people that are uh, you know, are non-binary or whatever, however you want to break down that the problem, how you want to break down how you categorize and group people. And sometimes you can have multiple categories, multiple inheritance, things like that. All the things you've been dealing with your entire life, how you organize your music collection, what defines different genres of music, how what defines music, is it an album, is it this, is it that. We've been dealing with hierarchies our entire lives. We just now have a nice you know, concept that we can play with in computer science when we're programming this. Okay, so all our vehicles have a speed, they have a max speed, they have a number of wheels, great. Not all vehicles have a gas tank, as I said. So maybe maybe gasoline vehicle is a kind of uh, is a kind of category. Maybe a uh, gasoline car is different than a uh, cuz you know airplane is completely different than a, uh, than a car. So gasoline car, electric car, two different classes of car. Uh, and I want to make a vehicle and with classes and data that all vehicles need and if I need to make little tweaks later on I can. I can override the or replace the original functions. I can add variables and functions in a subclass. I can tweak things along as I go. But the foundation, the thing that everyone goes like, yeah, that's a vehicle. That you're trying to figure out what that that parent class is, that that what a ve what a vehicle is, and then the child class is car, motorcycle, bicycle. Those are you're going to do a little tweaking. And there's no one-stop shop, one way of doing it. This is an art form that people spend years and years working on. We're just going to take a first step. The idea is that. That's what we want. We don't do things like this because we think it's, you know, prettier looking or anything like that. If you look at computer scientists, they like pretty code, sure. But it's always about being lazy, just not having to redo things or find bugs later on. Make sure, making sure the code is right the first time so you don't have to revisit it, revisit it again later. So let's inherit, and if we're talking about enhancing a class, uh, we keep the existing class we, and then we use it as a base. So we have our class, we use it as a base that all of these child classes are going to take for free. If you make a child class that does nothing, it's the exact same thing as a parent class. If you add nothing to the child class, it is the parent class. So a library item is a kind of object, let's say, or it's a class. So I can make an a library item. A book is a special kind of library item. It has library, all library items have some kind of special marker or number to identify them. And the library book has maybe a number of pages. A library journal, but the, one of those bound journals, which may know you may never have seen before in your lives, a bound journal is a special kind of library book, if you will, or a special kind of publication for or library item, right? And it has the range of art, of issues for that particular journal and the page ranges that were dealt with. It could just be an upgrade of it. So we can talk about uh, USB devices versus USB 2 and USB 3 devices being a special subset. A USB 3 is an improvement on the original USB. They're all backwards compatible. Uh, or your thing could just be a bit more productive or a bit better than the original base class. 
So we can also look at this in terms of phylogeny. These are all just sort of metaphors if it helps you understand what we're trying to get at. So we could talk about mammals. What's special about them? I can make a mammal class. All mammals have some things in common. They produce milk. They or have a lot in common. They don't all have these all of these things, but they have most of these things in most cases. So most mammals produce uh, all mammals produce milk. Most mammals have hair. Most mammals give birth to live young. Most mammals have a good olfactory sense. Most mammals tend to destroy things. Great. So how about this? I always forget what the name of the actual the actual proper name for it. I call keep calling it a spiny anteater. It's from Australia. Does it give birth to live young? Nope. It gives it lays eggs. What? It's a mammal. It makes milk. It has hair. It gives it makes eggs. So does a platypus, by the way. Right? Or some of them have pouches, like a kangaroo. Marsupials do not give birth they give birth to live young, but they're not fully developed live young. Uh has a great sense of smell though it eats ants um, and smells out ant, uh, ant colonies how about it tends to destroy things probably um, at least ants would agree that they destroy things right how about this mammal produces has hair gives birth very special kind of mammal it's the only mammal that flies right that's a special subclass of mammalia Right? It has everything a normal mammal has, except it has a really, I mean, it sense a smell. It's actually probably okay, but it flies. How about this one? Nobody here on at the time. It actually has hairs inside its body, and it has hairs in, uh, in utero, I think, as well. Uh, I'm assuming pretty crappy olfactory sense, because you don't really smell a lot under the water. Right? Give birth to live young? Yes. Produces milk? Yes. Destroys things? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know about dolphins. Destroy things? Definitely humans. But humans have a terrible olfactory sense compared to every other, mo most other mammals. Right? These are things that are make each group special. And humans would have uses tools. Not all animals, all mammals use tools. Otters and humans use tools. Uh, there's a bunch of these things. Build cities. Only one mammal actually does that. So, classes have shared member variables, and so the parent class has all the member variables, and then I just add extra stuff to it. So, a class is a template that has functions, it has data, it has different types. And this is, every time I make an object, it is a special kind of that template. But if the classes are similar but not identical, what I want is something that they all have in common, the base class that has everything in common, and then the child classes have a little bit extra, have a little something a little bit different. So we could have something like here's our member base class. Class two has everything that member one has, plus it has you know a third member. Class two has uh, class one has everything member it has member one same member variable. It also has member variable number two. Here is an instance of a class. Here is an instance of this class. Here is an instance of this class. All three, object one, two, and three, all have to have a member ver member variable one. These two have member variable two. Object 2.1 has member variable three, not member, uh, member variable type two. So you add every time I go up a level, every time I have a child class, I will modify my original, well, the, the parent class, and tweak things around a bit, adding an extra variable, changing a variable changing how that variable is used. I can add new variables. I can implement things in a different way. I can overload and change the uh, so I can add new functions or I can over override and change the you know the function what I did before. I can add, add, have it do a bit more. I can remove what it had before. So the shape class all shapes are, have to have these kinds of things like being able to paint to the screen. They also have to have a particular size, let's say. I may have a two-dimensional shape class, and that two-dimensional shape class has different child classes like a circle, a square, or a triangle. All two-dimensional shapes may have an area, they may have a, the ability to draw onto the screen. A three-dimensional shape class all have a volume and ability to draw onto the screen. And you'll have a sphere, a cube, and a tetrahedron. 
right? They're all, you can see that a three-dimensional shape is the more general, generic version of the of, of a sphere, a cube, or a tetrahedron. It's the more general term. So if this is less specific than the child class. So every child should have what the parent has, and the parent is normally less specific than the child. One way of looking at this, and I like pointing this out, so let's pop it down here. Um, one way of looking at this is the following. So, and I'm going to put a thing here. Uh, I'm going to say functions just to keep it simple. I think I have this somewhere else. This, if I if I make a class, I have something like this. I have a bunch of variables, I have a bunch of functions that are wrapped together in one thing called a particular class. Here's what the uh, this is what happens with inheritance. I will have my base. I'll call it B. Let's have another class. Base class. Call it B. And then I have the child class and I'm going to color this child class in and then I'll have a different child class and I'll color that child class in. Notice they are the outside wrapper of this thing the functions that the child class has the member variables that the child class have are different between the two different child classes but the center part the the essence of those classes the thing they have in common the base class is the same for both and so we have the same base or center of this thing I have a bunch of member variables and functions in common between the two and then I wrap around it new functions new variables so all my variables are everything from that line up so here and here both of these they're all my variables all my functions are wrapped together I got a bunch of stuff from the parent and I got some of my own I got a bunch of stuff from the parent I have some of my own the stuff that's on my own is new to me Okay, you can also say uh, community members, then we have, if we have Carleton community members, well, how do we break down? Well, there's employees of Carleton, there's students at Carleton, there's alumni at Carleton, and, well, amongst employees, we have faculty and staff, they are different, we have a single inheritance. Uh, I will say this one. I say here be dragons on this case multiple inheritance there are languages out there that will not even allow you to do multiple inheritance C will and C++ actually more importantly will allow multiple inheritance but it's normally some people go <laughs> for that like Java will not allow multiple inheritance at all so you cannot have a parent you cannot be a child class of two different classes you can imagine that Maybe you should be allowed to be that, but no, no, in Java you're not allowed to do that. So if you're an administrator and a faculty member, you cannot be administrator, faculty, administrative teacher. Okay. So here's actually what it's going to look like. Here's my base class, B, a very original name here. Here's my base class, B. It has a variable, a member variable named B. It has a constructor. It has a function called bar. Here is my so this is in my header file, if you will. Here is my construct. Here's my constructor being defined for b. B. I'm going to set my value b to three. I'm going to call bar. Bar is just going to print off this, and probably fix, should fix that quote. But okay, that's all bar is going to do. Here is class b b. It's going to extend. You can say extends. That's one way we, we tend to use the term. You'll actually see it in Java, say literally using the word extends. But BB is a child class of B, very original name. Here is a constructor for BB. Here is the function bar, the 
looks the same, doesn't it? Here is the function foo. When we get to this part here, this is where we're going to get some polymorphism. So just, just letting you know. Here is my constructor BB. And so what's going to end up happening? If I make, <laughs> let's try this out. Let's make, um, If I call this, what's going to happen? I'm going to go into here. <sighs> Just so I'm going to get ahead of myself here. I'm going to go into this function, which is my constructor. It's then immediately going to call the parent's constructor before I get into it. So step one is this. Step two is this. Go doing the rest of my... Con so step one is all of that. Step two is doing the rest of my constructor. Okay. Here's where it's, things are going to get a little weird. So I make a new object. I haven't started it yet, so I go over to here. I set b to v the value 3. I then call the bar function. But the bar function, I am currently, the, the, b, the class bb has not been made yet. The class B is the only thing that's been made. I'm going to go to the bar function and just going to go, okay, print this thing over here. And I'm going to just, there we go. It's then going to, so let's put, let's change this number here. Put the two here. I'm now going to call that function. I'm then going to go back over three. Do the re and then do the rest of it. Notice foo is never actually called. I could call foo. Uh, if I call foo here, let's put the foo in here. So, and three, and then finish off. Oh, I don't want it like that. Look at that. And then finish off. So I will, when I make a new object, I will go to the child class, oh, to the parent class, call the constructor in the parent class, do everything in the constructor of the parent class. When I am done, including calling bar here, when I'm done, I will go back over here. Then I will finally have BB. I then should call, I will set B to the value 4. Because my variable here exists both here and here. B is, four, is equal to 4. Then I'm going to call foo. I'm going to print B, B, foo, N at the end. Whew. So what I should end up having is B colon bar being spread out, and then B, B, foo also being spit out. B, B bar is not used at all because bar only exists when I've initialized. So bar, this bar here, only this, only this function here exists. This hasn't been created yet. The object hasn't been created. I call the parent, do the parent stuff, and then I go back. But this is the kind of thing where inheritance comes in handy or where you need to get a lot more exposure to it. The takeaway is B has a constructor. It has another additional function. It has a member variable. When I make a child class, I automatically get access to that variable. And I'll have a new, I can make a, you know, new functions that are going to override the old one. And I can make new functions that didn't exist before. And there's a particular order between the parent class and the child class and how things go when it comes to creating new objects and deleting those new ob those objects at the end. And we'll see an example of that in a, in a second or in a little while. I want to, I'm going to stop the video for a second because I want to look at this in a bit more detail. So what we are going to do next is I'm going to break out double, my, a doubly linked list 
we're going to do our linked list class that we did last time but instead of just being a linked list like it was last time it's going to be a doubly linked list I have a next and I have a previous for each one of my nodes I'm gonna have a next and a previous now I already have a next in my linked list node class so what I want is a D linked list node or DLL node class that has that extends or inherits from the linked list node class so I'm gonna make a node class that has the parents the old version of the code plus something X plus something else the previous and then a doubly linked list for every single one of these nodes I have a previous and a next I also my doubly linked list has a starting point and an end point so that I can instead of if I wanted to get the last element of my list before I had to go walk all the way down my doubly linked list find the last element make sure it's the last element and return it now I can just say oh yeah there's the last element I already have a pointer to it if I want to go back one step I go back once I can just walk back one step I can start from the end and work my way to the front or I can start for the front and work my way to the end it does involve more bookkeeping so having a doubly linked list is not standardized across the board but we're gonna try and do I'm gonna extend the linked list class that we just made into a doubly linked list class and we'll see how inheritance works okay that's for us a, a presentation in the future in the near future all right thanks everyone